Excellent. Well, good morning, everyone. Wasn't that keen at something? Honestly, I feel like I've been doing everything wrong for 30 years now. Um, but in a good way, I think. Uh, I've actually been talking about this sort of thing with a colleague at work just in the past couple of months. So maybe now is the time. Maybe something's afoot. Something is a change in the newer sphere of programming. Um, my name's Guy Davidson. Uh, I'm the coding manager at Creative Assembly. I'm in charge of making programmers better programmers. Uh, I also assist in recruitment and development of all our staff. And uh, making people write better code, really. That's the, uh, that's the important thing I do. I also look after the infrastructure for our Total War series of games. So that means I look after interfacing with the operating system, really. Um, everything that's, that, that, that is going to be affected by changes to operating systems and hardware. Today I'm going to talk about SG14. Um, I'll tell you what SG14 is as time goes on. It'll become clear, don't worry. Um, so I'm going to be covering four topics particularly. So the first is a brief history of the working group. WG21 is the C++ working group. And SG14 is the most recently convened study group. ISO, the International Standards Organization, has a number of working, working groups. In fact, it has a big hierarchical organization of stuff going on. We only really care about WG21, which is ISO C++. Um, I've divided the efforts of study group 14 into three sections that seem to form the primary concerns um, of all the contributors to the study group. So the first is, don't pay for what you don't use. We've all heard that many times, I'm sure, but many of us on the group aren't quite sure that that's always the case. Um, the second is containers and algorithms. Um, there are a few things that turn up in every game code base, um, and they could usefully be included in the standard library. And um, finally, I'll cover parallelism and vectorization uh, and ask you know, where we are with this and where we're likely to go. These are apparently relatively new topics, but um, we've been on them for quite a while in games. So the group was created in response to a question asked at CPPCon 2014. Um, and it was asked of all the podium, which is where are the games company representatives. The podium was full of all the luminaries of C++ from Microsoft, and from IBM and from Intel, but there was nobody up there from any games developers at all. Finance was there. There were some embedded systems people there, people from Raycall, but uh, nobody from a games company at all. And we have particular needs, low latency and real time. Um, don't we all, though, really? You know, we want things to be responsive and fast and super lovely uh, and, and easy, on the, easy on the user, particularly. Um, but we have special needs, particularly uh, for console programmers. So this is consoles like the PlayStation 4 and the Xbox. I should start. Does anyone here actually play games? Good, good. That's, that's a relief. I've done a talk like this before and got about two hands, which made it enormously tricky. I'm glad you all play games. Thank you. Um, performance and efficiency for games, are, it's, it's front and center of what we do. I work for a games company, and so do the majority of the contributors in SG14. Um, so I'm going to focus on that particular domain. So at least you have experience with games. Um, but it is quite transferable, though. Um, indeed, the interests of you know, these four areas, simulations, financial trading, and embedded systems, are also served by this group. So although it is mainly games dev, we're getting more and more people from other areas you know, started to make contributions to the group. Um, so there was a few months of lively chatter on a Google group after the CPPCon uh, question. Um, and then in June 2014, the WG21 org chart was updated to this. Who's seen this chart before? Okay. Right, so, so this is how... This is it. This is what everyone gets together and chats about a lot and makes decisions about and changes the way that we use C++, how the language works. Um, it's from the ISO CPP website, isocpp.org. You should be going there you know, a lot if you're a C++ developer. I'm interested in all of these study groups here. Um, uh, I should say, you know, WG21 C++ committee. Herb, Herb Sutter is the chairman here. And then we have the working group for the language and the library working group. And then, you know, the development of these things. And then we have a number of study groups which cover you know, particular areas of interest. Concurrency, uh, numerics, databases, Ranges, very popular right now. Concepts. On Monday morning, I had a 118-line error message. 118! 
<laughs> there goes my Monday, really. Um, concepts would have made that much easier. But 118, it was a new record. Very apposite, I thought, for the uh, talk I'm about to give. Um, Michael Wong is our chair. Um, now, how we do business, well, there's a reflector. This is um, a, a Google group. Um, it's quite low volume, very, very high signal to noise ratio, which is very nice. It's a bit less than tempos today. Um, there are se several papers in flight, um, which is the meat of this presentation. Um, there's a GitHub repository, uh, which I, well, I am WG21SG14 on GitHub. Uh, it's not very busy nowadays because we've got a lot of early noise where a lot of the cases were laid out and, and, and made clear. Uh, so now, you know, if you grab hold of this, you'll be able to see you know, all the things that we're talking about, and it's, it's quite stable. We have monthly telecoms. Um, these are you know, dial-in teleconferences uh, hosted by Michael Wong at IBM. Um, we get good attendance. There's usually over a dozen people uh, will be turning up, talking and chatting, um, which is, you know, compared to the other groups, is very noisy. All the other study groups will also have telecoms, but I'm told that they usually expect two, three, four people phoning in. Sometimes we've had you know, 30 people yammering away, you know, trying, to <laughs> trying to get their, uh, uh, their point across. And Michael's very good at um, chairing all of these. Here's Michael Wong. I think he's at a wedding here. Um, he's got an extraordinary biography. Uh, when asked, what have you done for C++? He's the head of the delegation for Canada to the ISO C++ committee, the voting representative for IBM to the US C++ committee, chair of WG21 SG5, um, he's been designing C++ compilers for 20 years. Uh, he, in the past, he was a C++ team lead to IBM's Excel C++ compiler and C compiler, currently leading C++ 11 deployment as a senior technical lead for IBM, co-author of a number of C++ 11 and OpenMP features, CEO of OpenMP, um, vice chair of Standards Council of Canada for Programming Languages, frequent speaker at various technical conferences, serves on the programming committee of Boost. Um, current research areas are uh, research interests are in the areas of parallel programming um, and C++ benchmark performance. Um, several work positions. He's astronomer and guide at the David Dunlop Observatory. Um, he holds a BSc in astrophysics. We like astrophysicists. A master's in mathematics. And he's retired as well. <laughs> <laughs> this is a man full of life and energy. I'm, I'm very pleased that he's chairing SG14. <laughs> um, we do things a little differently in games. Um, and I said this to Scott Myers. We got Scott Myers in for some training at my company a couple of years ago. And the first thing I said when he came through the door was, you know, we, we do things a little differently in games. And he looked at me, smiled, and said, yeah, everyone says that. But really, we do. <laughs> uh, now, I'm going to see if Claire of CC is on my side and see if I can actually play this video. Nope. Not like that. OK. Who's seen a game video before? Who's seen a video of a game being played? Who knows what games look like? Great, OK, let's do it this way. I want you to imagine <laughs> I'm going to act this out through interpretive dance. So I'll let <laughs> Our latest game uh, is called Total War Warhammer. Um, Warhammer's an incredibly popular franchise. Total War is a slightly less popular franchise, possibly. But the two together are dynamite. Really, they are. Um, now. What you would see if I was playing this, no, <laughs> what you would see is um, a battlefield, a giant battlefield with about 20,000 soldiers individually laying siege to a, um, to a city uh, with city walls, things on city walls, all sorts of animated soldiers, very prettily decorated, uh, wearing fine uniforms, brightly colored, just an enormous amount of movement, flying beasts, Pegasus, dragons, um, people on the beast being captured off the beast and dropped to the floor, all sorts of really, really exciting. Look at the video. Go and find it. It's fantastic. But look at the video. The point that I want to make, though, is this video, in all its finery, was captured in real time at 30 hertz. That's a hell of an undertaking. This means that we've got to do all the activity and all the rendering for each frame in 33 milliseconds. So let's do the maths on that. We have a 3 gigahertz processor, for example which gives us 100 million cycles per frame. We have 20,000 soldiers, so that's about 5,000 cycles per soldier. Um, it, with those 5,000 cycles, we have to choose what to do 
and how to animate the soldier as a result. 5,000 cycles. Okay. Then we have to worry about cache coherency, which kills your cycles as your cache empties up. Um, there are some tricks that we can do. First of all, we can run the world, the simulation of the world, at 10 hertz rather than at 30 hertz. And then we can interpolate the animation on the intervening, in the intervening frame. So that gives us 15,000 cycles per, so per soldier. We can demand two cores of the user and share out some of the work. This is not particularly onerous. Processes have been multi-core for a long time now. And we can rely on all of our, all of our users having two cores available. Um, of course, we have to render the output as well. Um, that's very costly. But fortunately, we have a GPU to help us out. Um, graphics cards are added into PCs. Most computers nowadays, or most Intel processors nowadays, come with an integrated uh, a graphics part. Uh, they're varying quality, which is, which is why people will splash out 400 pounds in inserting a graphics card into their machines. Telling a GPU what to do, though, is very CPU intensive, um, let alone the actual doing of it. Um, so you have to work out what you have to draw from the camera position, and then what resources you need to push over to the graphics card. And now we're into heterogeneous computing. That's a modern buzz buzzword. There are two different styles of programming for do two different types of microprocessor for the CPU and for the GPU. Actually, I'll say microprocessor. First processor, about 1969, the Intel 4004, about 10 microns for the, uh, for the components inside. Um, the latest Intel processor has now gone to the, is now the, the, the parts are less than 10 nanometers wide. So it uh, sounds to me like we're into nanoprocessors now rather than microprocessors, unless there's a different derivation of the word. If anyone knows, I'm, I'm interested in that sort of thing. Um, I haven't even mentioned sound yet. That's a whole, you know, getting the stereoscopic position of all the things that can be generating the sound. If you've got 20,000 entities generating sound, you've got to work out, ah, can we hear that soldier being stabbed in the stomach? What sort of sound does he make? In our last game, we had 4,000 individually sampled footstep sounds for a right foot going on gravel and a left foot going on gravel, or for a right foot going through snow while someone's carrying a sword in their left. It's it, just 4,000. Attention to detail, you see. Um, that's not it. We have a variety of specifications to worry about on a consumer PC. Um, we could have 64 gigabytes of RAM or three. Uh, we could have a 400 pound graphics card or an integrated laptop graphics part. Um, optimization is front and center. You have to keep the caches full, keep the cores busy, which is not much different from you know, the regular advice, as I say. But we can't throw more cores at the problem. We can't just say, oh, it's not enough. You're going to need to buy a bigger computer. We don't have that luxury. Software needs to run on a broad set of hardware. And that hardware is specified by the public, by the buying public who buy the computers to run these games on. Um, or a single piece of hardware for a console, a PlayStation 4, or a 3, or an Xbox. Or a Sega Saturn. I worked for Sega. We did, we, did, we did hardware a long time ago. We have one advantage, which is that all the architectures are pretty much the same nowadays. Um, they're all x86-64 processors. Um, in the consoles, they're, they're actually custom AMD parts uh, for, the, for the processors. All the graphics cards are by NVIDIA, or ATI, or Intel. So we only have to worry about three sets of graphics drivers to interface with. Um, a game is quite different from a windowed application. Uh, with a windowed application, you're waiting on messages, and then you're processing the message, and it takes as long as it takes to process the message. And if you don't like how long it takes, then you can put more memory in your machine or buy a faster machine. We don't, as I say, we just don't have that, lu that luxury. This game is going all the time, all the time, working, working, working. <laughs> no let up at all. SG14 also caters for embedded programs as well. Uh, they have sy systems which have you know, finite amounts of RAM. They come in a really tiny amounts of RAM. Um, they also have limited tool sets quite often. And this is much like console programming uh, in the old days, certainly. Programming for the PS2 was a beastly job when compared with programming for the PC. The tool set was you know, rather, rather thinner. So getting on, don't pay for what you don't use. Everyone's heard this. And ever since I started in C++, Exceptions were almost a non-feature. The same can be said for RTTIs. This starting to sound like this morning's keynote. The standard library, um, this is an incredibly useful set of functionality. Don't get me wrong, it's absolutely fabulous, but it does come at a price. Runtime allocation is problematic. Allocating from the heap whilst the game is running 
um, can be quite a problem because it takes a non-deterministic amount of time. We don't know how long it's going to take. And you might think, surely it's only a matter of nanoseconds. Yes, that's exactly the problem. It's a matter of nanoseconds. We need those nanoseconds. We really, really do need them. Um, and function calls. Function calls um, are costly. All this prologue and epilogue code, getting the stack ready, all that kind of business. Deep inlining can't always be relied upon. Um, and virtual function calls are cash killers. So let's look at exception costs, first of all. Deterministic destruction. This is the preeminent feature of C++. We all, this is why I love the language so much. If, there was one, if I had to get rid of everything, I was only allowed to keep one feature. That's the one that I would keep, knowing when something is dead, knowing when it's expired, being able to rely on it no longer existing. However, it is, of course, complicated by exception handling, um, particularly if you're throwing an exception through the stack, up several, you know, up several, um, several calls through the stack, uh, or through different compilation units, or through DLLs. Um, you have to clean up after yourself, or rather the code has to clean up after itself, which is really what the problem is. You don't know when the exception's going to be thrown. So the code's got to know, oh, got to be able to clean up. So the code has got to be instrumented with cleanup code. So there are two ways out of a function. There's return, or there's an uncaught exception. So the return is nice, the uncaught exception is nasty. The return is nice because it's a well-defined point where, um, you know, even with multiple return statements, it's a well-defined point where you say, clean up here, please. Clean your room, off you go. There we are. Exception handling can be required at any function call. Um, it can, I say any function call. If there's a called function and it's in the same compilation unit and that function doesn't call anything and it doesn't throw any exceptions, then the compiler can relax a little and it can say, all right, you're, you're no trouble. I don't need to worry about you. That's fine. But this is very much the exception rather than the rule. <laughs> I couldn't resist. I'm sorry. <laughs> Generally, the code needs to know which destructors to call at any point that an exception can be passed through. And there are two ways of creating all this cleanup code, all the unwinding. So you can put it all in the function. Um, this keeps it local. It requires minimum context. Um, but of course, it bloats the code, because you've suddenly got all this cleanup code everywhere. And it also kills the instruction cache. This will make your functions just that bit longer. And it will make your instruction cache more liable to, be, uh, you know, to go cold. The other way is tables of exception sites with context. So rather than having the code in line in the function, you can just put it over there somewhere. And have the exception handler saying, oh, we're at this point. That means we'll need this. This can make our binaries quite large. Well, considerably larger, actually. Um, but it means that the instruction cache doesn't get hammered. And this latter approach seems to be more popular now, uh, which I'm quite relieved about. Not that we use exceptions, but you know, it's good to know that there's, you know, there are options. Um, Patrice Roy um, made a presentation to the SG14 meeting at CppCon 2015. So this is the first time that all of us got face to face and started talking about our issues. Papers were presented, uh, you know, discussions were discussed. Um, I'm not going to go through the paper. There it is. It's a good paper. But his summary was exceptions have a non-zero cost. Um, and there are some use cases where exception handling is actually consistently faster than regular error handling. Um, there is obviously a cost in terms of binary size, and implementations do seem to be open to improvement. Now, there'll be another video here. Um, on the last keynote of CppCon, uh, Eric Niebler spoke about ranges for the standard library. This is really exciting stuff. Hello? I thought it was the exception user. The cost is just actually the exception, but not throwing Yep, I'll come back to that. I, I cover this shortly. But thank you for the question. If you do want to ask questions, absolutely go for it. I'll try and answer them, or I might be answering them lately, uh, later. There's a lot of foreshadowing in this presentation. One of the exciting things about ranges is that it requires uh, a whole new implementation of the STL. There's, this, there's now this thing called STL2 uh, in development, which deals entirely on ranges. And when Eric mentioned SDL2 in his talk, the first thing I thought of was exception handling. And I asked him, you know, what do you think about exceptions? What will you be doing? And his answer, and this is quite the usual answer, is that, well, 
you know, if you're not handling exceptions, then you're handling errors some other way. You're paying the cost some other way. It's just, you know, you're, you're just moving the problem around, which is true to a point. Um, it's an unpleasant choice. If you remove exceptions, then you handle errors another way. But we don't. We simply don't handle errors. By and large, if something goes wrong, it's because of something that's out of our control. You know, for a start, what are you going to do if something goes wrong in a game? You're going to quit, tell the user, sorry, something's gone wrong. You're going to apologize, uh, maybe offer a patch later on. <coughs> Nobody dies. Nobody dies from bugs in games. You know, this isn't nuclear power stations or medical software or, or, or missile guidance you know, <laughs> software or space shuttle software. This is, this is a game. We have extensive quality assurance. So, you know, showstopper bugs that will actually, you know, bring the game to a, you know, crashing down um, are generally caught very early. Um, and I've seen fights break out over a one megabyte buffer that suddenly become available, you know, in the late stages of game development. And, and that's the kind of thing that's going to militate against the use of exceptions. There's a very, very limited set of non-deterministic inputs. You've got a keyboard, a mouse, a controller, all those kinds of things, just, just ones and zeros. And you've got a file system. That's really the only thing that you can't rely on. Um, and so the errors tend to be very easy to handle there and then. And so game devs will write exception unsafe code. Now, the standard library obviously does throw exceptions in some places, for example, from stood thread. But throwing is not the expensive part. Catching is the expensive part. Um, and I'll come back to standard library issues in a moment. However, having said all that, I've got to add a postscript here, because it was, uh, I was informed about a week ago that, that, so we do two products at Creative Assembly. Um, we have the Total War franchise, and we have the console team that does, uh, at the moment, they're writing Halo Wars, uh, the sequel, for Xbox One and for Windows 10. Um, they've switched on exception handling. Yes. I look forward to the post-mortem, um, and maybe I'll be giving another talk next year about why you should use exceptions in games. Watch this space. I'm just going to touch on RTTI. Um, Cope said everything, really. Um, so it's the mechanism by which type ID, operator, and dynamic cast are made possible. Does anyone actually use RTTI here? Ooh, a few of it. Hmm. I've, I've never really used it, so I'm not quite sure you know, what benefits it offers, I suppose. Um, you know... You have a hierarchy, and you need a cross cast valid, but it's the only thing that can cross. Yeah, yeah, okay. Casting's a bit unpleasant for me. I, <laughs> it, it's working so much with first-party code. We don't have much third-party code. We generally know our types, I suppose, or we don't build hierarchies. It, does, it just... I think we avoid RTTI, and so that will affect the way that we write our code. Um, so I've not really got much experience with RTTI. Um, it does come with a runtime cost as well. Obviously, the clue's in the name. Um, and each object needs to store a word in describing its type. Strewstrup didn't actually want RTTI. Um, he saw similar introspection mechanisms being you know, heavily abused and misused at the time. However, in 1992, he proposed dynamic cast, um, which made it obviously into the 1998 standard. And so the consumer won in this case because everybody actually had RTTI of some kind in their library. Anybody work with MFC? Probably quite a few of you. Ooh, fewer than I expected, okay. Um, everything derives from C object, which is you know, some kind of RTTI. You know where you are because you can go, go up to C object and take, a look, and take a look at what you're dealing with. So the committee said, well, let's standardize it. That's really what they were doing. So, but of course, once it was in, everybody wondered, well, when should you use it then? Um, particularly when you've got such lovely functions, features as virtual functions, uh, which seem to provide an awful lot of support that RTTI might support. Um, and if you have a first edition of Effective C++ um, lying about your library, you can read plenty of bad things about RTTI. Scott Myers doesn't like RTTI at all. Um, and so, you know, game developers, we simply don't use it. We're iffy about virtual function calls, to be honest. Um, so RTTI. And what happens when dynamic cast fails? Throws an exception. 
So let's look at the cost of the standard library. So this, you know, this is a huge, it's a mighty piece of work. I think it's one of the wonders of the programming discipline, frankly. Currently, the C++ standard weighs in at a backbreaking 1,500 pages. If I say backbreaking, it's a PDF. Still, it's 1,500 pages, and if you were to print it all off, it'd be, it'd be quite heavy. The standard library starts at page 444. Most of our standard is actually all about the library. However, it is exception safe. The standard doesn't mandate an implementation here. Um, and as I said, throwing is the problem. Sorry, catching is the problem, not throwing. No exceptions doesn't mean, by the way, don't handle stack unwinding. Um, if, you, if you stick your no exceptions on your, on, on your command line, and there's a similar, there's a similar command line option uh, in MSBS as well, it doesn't mean, right, exceptions have gone completely. The runtime will still handle exceptions for when they're thrown. It's just that your code will not have or will not be allowed to have any exception handling code in there. So the runtime, and the runtime will actually change handlers every time you enter a try block. Hello. I guess it's Craig and Swaffles that are constant. Craig and Swaffles have a way of paradigm for generating objects to make them from the exception state. Is that another cost in, in, embedded in the runtime? Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so by default, um, the runtime handler, when it, you know, when it catches an exception, it will show you an, uh, an operating system dialog saying something's gone wrong. I'm sorry, this problem, program has experienced a problem. You know, do you want to close or restart? You might be able to attach a debugger. If you're in a debugger and it goes wrong, then you can see where it went wrong. Um, games do tend to install their own top-level exception handlers. Uh, and what will happen was they'll, they'll phone home and they'll say, oops, something's gone wrong, fix this bug. And it'll offer an apology to the user, as, you know, as, as I said before. If stack unwinding, oops. yeah, if stack unwinding is disabled, the compiler will complain at the site of a try catch block. That's try catch block. And avoiding the function doesn't help if it's in a, if it's in a template, uh, in a class template or a, a class member function, class template member function template or something like that then Clang will zip through it, find it, and, and, and warn you. The compiler may have a flag, has exceptions equal zero, for example, but you can't rely on it. It's not part of the standard. When we started building the Empire code base, the TW3, which is a code base we're still using, and this was in 2005, we were using the beta edition of Visual Studio 2005. It had such a, a preprocessor flag, has exceptions equal zero. Great, we're going to use the standard. This is fantastic. We can use a lot of it. We, have. we, were, we were delighted until um, the release to manufacture came out, and that had gone. So we had to use exceptions. And we suddenly saw a drop of about 6% in our frame rate, just from the disappearance of that, of that flag. Um, you know, we could force a proposal through. Who's with me? Yes! Let's force a proposal through. Let's change the language. Let's change the... It won't work. Well, it might work, but it wouldn't be good for the language. It really wouldn't. Implementers would be forced down you know, a very dark alley really, um, and it would hamper further development of the language. We have exceptions, you know, we should learn to live with them or learn to avoid them. One suggestion that was uh, offered was to have no-throw scopes. Because at the moment, you can decorate your functions with no-throw, and this tells the compiler, don't expect any throws from here, you don't need to put any exception code in here, it's fine, we're fine, we're fine. Um, but that means, you know, since C++11, with existing code, our code base has something like four million lines of code, I think, um, all our functions, we have to go through, put no throw on everything. And, you know, we're wearied by this. But the idea of putting no throw at a scope seems like, a, you know, seems like an interesting idea. So the standard, uh, the standard library is exception safe. It's also thread safe. And that's actually also a problem for us um, because synchronization costs. You look at shared pointer, and the shared pointer falls out of scope, quite a mutex, is it time for me to destroy? No, it's not here, have it back again. Um, and also, const member functions have to be thread safe, as per section 17659-3 in the standard library. Um, Herb Sutter's up with that, I didn't, look, I didn't look it up, it's fine. Um, and the thing is, we know more about our code, we're able to make stronger assertions about our threads, and so this obviates the need for many of these constructs. Also, the library is implemented for maintainability. This is a good thing. However, um, std vector can sometimes nest, or the implementation, sorry, the Visual Studio implementation of std vector can sometimes nest, you know, five function calls 
inside a public member function call, uh, and this will militate against inlining. Um, also, there is some excellent debugging support in the Microsoft implementation. Um, iterator debug levels, however, can be quite costly. Um, we took out iterator debug levels from our code, and we found we got a 10,000% improvement in our performance of uh, the associative containers. So, you know, be, there's a cost there. When you're running in debug, you don't want the game to grind to a halt. It actually does need to be tested. So rolling your own containers is a rite of passage. Um, performance beats maintenance, really. Well, that's what we're about. Uh, has anyone heard of EASTL? Excellent. EASTL, so Electronic Arts, is a large games publisher. They've been around for a long, long, long time, certainly since the 80s. Uh, in about the 90s, a chap, I think his name was Pedriani, um, got to work on re-implementing the STL entirely in a way that was suitable for games developers. So this had Im implications for the allocators and also for exception handling. Uh, and in February of this year, it was open sourced. I'm absolutely delighted about that. Um, it also has shallow inlining, very handy. Um, the allocators are slightly different. Um, I'll cover allocators shortly. Um, and there's no try catching, no try catch blocks anywhere. Generally, it performs better than the vendor implementations. Um, it's moved the problems elsewhere, where we don't care about them, really. Um, but therefore, it's not standard compliant. Um, but I look forward to reading about its adoption and use. Um, there isn't much, you know, there aren't many post-mortems about their use yet. I'm sure they'll come thick and fast. Allocators are actually a very serious matter. Heap allocation is a headache, as I've described. Runtime allocation from the heap is avoided as far as possible, um, because the time to achieve is non-deterministic, as I said. Um, the operating environment of a desktop machine can't be relied upon. Um, we don't know how much RAM there is, the amount of RAM varies, the amount of, um, uh, you know, the amount of processes the user is using <coughs> can't be known when, when we're starting. Some processes can be real beasts to the user's operating environment. Antivirus software can, can kill a game. I mean, users know not to do silly things like you know, try and stream video or try and stream HD video whilst they're playing a game. Um, but stuff does soak up RAM. There's no getting away from that. So it's usual to assign budgets. Um, and you track your allocations by diverting operator new and warning of over-allocation in any particular areas. So, and you can allocate slabs for particular sizes of allocation if you think, Do you know what, we've got an enormous number of 32-byte allocations. Then you can say, oh, well, look, here's, here's all your 32-byte allocations. They can live in this chunk of memory. It makes the housekeeping much easier. Um, Fragmentation is the real problem, though. Quite often, well, no, always, when you start an application, you have your, your sunlit, unspoilt uplands of, 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 of address space with nothing in there. Everything's absolutely you know, virgin territory, ready for, ready for filling up with, uh, with your allocations. And usually what happens is after a little while, you end up with little holes everywhere uh, because you know, you'll allocate something, and then you'll free it, and then you'll allocate something, and then you'll free it, and you'll allocate something, and then you'll free it. But sometimes you'll you'll allocate things and free them at different rates in different places. So you end up with sort of little holes appearing, and that can stop large allocations. You've got, you've got a tiny little hole somewhere. Um, this particularly happens, sadly, as initialization. When you're initializing your game or initializing a particular level or something like that, you can create things and create more things and then destroy the thing that we're using to create the thing. And, and it, it, gets, it gets very messy. So one solution is to take advantage of what you know about your solution space. Um, so bear in mind that default operator new is the worst case scenario. Okay? Operator new is for when you know nothing about the duration of your allocation. You don't know anything about the size of it other than you know, the, size of the, thing you're, the, thing, the size of the actual thing you're allocating, regardless of anything that might be allocated as a result of allocating that thing. Um, but in real-time software, you have more clues available to you. For example, you know that there, are, that there are allocations which will last for a single frame of a render. So you think, OK, what we can do is we can divide our, we can divide our, 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 our heap into two and say, right, well, let's have two heaps. And this heap is for everything that lasts just for one render frame. And this heap is for everything that lasts for, you know, for longer. And one of the reasons why this is a useful thing to do, besides the fact that it reduces fragmentation, is it's very easy to test if you put something in the right place. Because at the top of the frame, you can say, is this heap empty? 
And if it's not empty, then you've made a false assumption about one of your allocations. You can move it over, or you can fix your assumption. Um, and those aren't the only loops that you can use. We've got an AI loop and a rendering loop, or a world simulation loop and a rendering loop. So we can have four heaps there. We can minimize our fragmentation in this way. The fragmentation problem diminishes, though, if you decide to target 64-bit operating systems. Warhammer is our first 64-bit game. Halo Wars on Xbox One and Windows 10 is 64-bit only. 64-bit um, gives you an unbelievable 16 exabytes of address space. Uh, I, yeah, I can't even conceive of an exabyte, frankly. On the Intel processor, the top 20 bits are masked off, though, because they're spoil sports. So actually, you have 16 terabytes. <sighs> um, Worse still, half is reserved for Windows, so you've actually you've only got eight terabytes. It, ah, ah. However, if you limit yourself to four gigabytes for consoles and eight gigabytes for Windows, this leaves you with 21 bits of address to play with. This is fabulous. You can partition up your address space into one gigabyte sections and say, okay, each of these can be you know, a different power of two. Each of these slabs can be a different power of two. And this gives you linear time allocation. I'm going to be rolling something like this out shortly, I hope. So memory is one of the biggest problems. There's no getting away from it. And as I say, for embedded systems as well, finite RAM, there's no getting away from it. Standard library objects also take up memory as well. What's the memory burden of this? Stood function bool int size t. Well, we just don't know. We can't know. <laughs> it may prompt for allocation for its state in the heap rather than, rather than on the stack. It's implementation specific. Um, RTTI is used in most implementations of std function that I've come across, which is not a problem in Visual Studio. Um, it is for Clang. Who was here last year and saw my talk? Thank you. <laughs> um, do you remember the chunk I did on templates? Wow, you're paying it. Oh, thanks, man. <laughs> um, what happens is that Clang parses, when it's parsing the code, it parses the entire template. It doesn't parse the bits that, are being, the bits that it knows are being used. It will parse the entire template. Um, so even, even if the function remains unused, it will parse the function, check it's OK, and warn you about it. This is actually quite handy, apart from the fact that if your std function implementation uses RTTI and you've switched off RTTI, and you never intend on using the functions which use RTTI, Clang will still say, nope, oh, error, will stop. So this means the std function is unavailable to non-RTTI projects built in Clang. Lots of people are having a go, though, at rolling their own std function. It's a fun hobby. Um, it's, it's, it's actually really illuminating, seeing how hard it is to write a std function when you're trying to roll your own. Um, Again, we could mandate an implementation. I still don't think that's a good idea. It reduces the flexibility of growth options for the standard. Sticking with functions, let's look at inlining and the virtual dispatch. So inline depth is a bit of a thorny issue. Programmers will often assume it's a free gift. Um, and it's virtually unlimited. If you look at the uh, Visual Studio documentation for the compiler, it tells you that by default it will inline up to a depth of 254 function calls. Who, who makes 254 calls? except when they're recurring. You know, it, it, However, the compiler will often stop early. We often find that it stops after about six calls. Um, Visual Studio is quite conservative. GCC uh, and the Intel compiler, they're much keener. And they'll, they'll, they'll go on for a bit longer. But the point is that, you know, as you're inlining, you can be bloating your code. Um, you know, sometimes function calls, however, are more expensive than inline code. You know, all the prologue and epilogue, <coughs> all the prologue and epilogue parts, you know, they, 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 they do take up space. So sometimes, actually, inlining code, if the actual meat of the function is a tiny bit in the middle, can give you a saving. So in those situations, you know, endless inlining, the compiler will say, yeah, this is great. Um, we haven't actually come up with any kind of solution on, this, on SG14. Um, it's a subject of conversation. Um, join the reflector. If you've got any ideas about how to improve inlining and improve the expectations we might have of it, we'd like to know. Other problem source, of course, is the virtual dispatch. So making a function call through the virtual dispatch, first of all, requires you finding the virtual function table. That's a data cache miss. 
Um, finding the pointer and calling the function, that's an instruction cache miss. And then executing the function itself, likely another data cache miss. So it's something we avoid in time-sensitive code. It kills your cache. But we often contain, when we do use them, we'll often contain pointers to base classes in the vector, and we'll call a function on each of them all the way through. So if you've got a whole pile of things you want to render, you'll call, ah, render, 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 render. And, this will, and it will call all the render functions everywhere. What would be really handy is if we could sort that container by function call. Um, so what we do is we gather the same overrides together and keep the instruction cache form. Um, we can't sort by type. That's not enough because, of course, different types might have the same overload. Now, really, what you want to do is sort all the types with the same overload you know, together. But engineers make trade-offs all the time. You know, function calls, just another one. Anyway, enough of that messing with the language. Container and, uh, containers and algorithms are the, you know, this is the meat and potatoes of what we do, really. Um, we've got plenty to say about extending the library. So we have the ring, which is a circular buffer implementation. We have the flat map and flat set. They're cache-friendly implementations of map and set. We have uninitialized memory algorithms. Now, this already has some support in the library, um, but we've got a few proposals to add to them. And then we have fixed point numbers, which are an alternative way of representing non-integer numbers, um, but with a uniform distribution of values. So the ring was proposed last year. It's been through a couple of meetings. Um, it's acquired suggestions for modification. It's acquired a co-author, Arthur O'Dwyer. Um, the latest version is here. <coughs> Excuse me. ancient structure, the ring. Let me take you back to the 1980s. Who was alive in the 80s? <laughs> yeah. Airbrushes, Athena posters, a girl scratching a bum, playing tennis. That, that. <laughs> <laughs> Programming the Z80 by Rodney Zax. Who read that? Hey, fantastic book. Um, I first wrote C in the mid-80s when I got a hard drive for my Atari ST, and it was bundled with a copy of Lattice C for reasons which I didn't quite understand. Um, and I've learned BASIC, I've learned Z80, I've learned 68000, I've learned 6502. Oh, let's try another language. Oh, see, this looks like fun. And here I am today, little did I know. Um, it felt like assembly, um, but with better names for things. Uh, it, was like, it was like a macro assembly language. I, I loved it. I was, uh, you know, the pride I felt when successfully compiling and linking, linking, oh, compiling and linking and executing my code, it's still makes me tingle. Buffers, buffers bowed to my command. They really did. Um, DMA transfer, you know, moving, moving, moving data into the buffers on, on, on one piece of hardware and then processing the buffers with, a, with, with the processor, you know, all at the same time. Inline assembly in my C code was a bit, ooh, but, you know. Um, but this was a standard thing that you would do. You'd fill a buffer with DMA and then you'd process it and then whilst you were processing, you'd fill the start of the buffer. So it's just going round and round and round. And I came across this concept time and again over the next 30 years. And everyone had their own name for it. Usually had two words. Well, the first word was ring or cyclic or fixed or rolling. And the second word was buffer or Q or FIFO. I was going to draw a little table so you could pick your own up. It's, it's amazing how vocal people are about identifiers um, and how hard it is to label things. Labeling things, I think, is actually the hardest part of programming, to be honest. Anyone heard of Parkinson's Law of Triviality? Yeah. So in 1957, C. Northcote Parkinson argued that organizations give disproportionate weight to trivial issues, and this is known as bike shedding. He coined the term bike shedding, or the bike shed effect, or the bicycle shed example. Um, and when I first put my paper together, I first came across somebody actually using bike shedding as a verb. Um, I was a little worried about what lay ahead and thinking, oh, God, are they just going to spend ages talking about the name of this thing rather than what it actually does? Um, Anyway, it's a useful container for SG14. Uh, it crops up everywhere in games. Um, the usual use cases are for um, asynchronous processing of messages, as I said, DMA in one end, inline processing out the other, or for keeping a buffer of the last n events. If you just want to say, right, the last thing that happened, it goes in here, and at some point you might want to say, oh, let's just take a look at the last few. Um, it differs from stood queue. The first thing that was asked was, well, why can't we just use a queue? 
but stood Q adapts list or deck. Is it pronounced deck, D-E-Q-U-E? -E? Yeah, okay. I, I, so many people argue about that one. Naming, oh. um, But list and deck aren't necessarily contiguous, and the thing that we're aiming for all the time in games is cache friendliness, contiguity of memory. Has anyone actually submitted a paper to the standards body here? Ooh, right. <laughs> well, here's my story. I started work after ATCU 2015, uh, and I thought I was finished after about three months uh, of tinkering and some review from friends and colleagues, some of whom may be in here. My lights are too blinding. Um, after all, it's not actually a tricky concept. You know, how hard can it be? Really, really, it's a ring. It just um, and I posted it to the reflector for consideration, and then first presented it at CPPCon in 2015. This was in uh, September. Got some feedback, spruced it up. Then Michael Wong presented it at Kona in Hawaii in 2015. They go to all the best places, they really do. Um, it got a lukewarm reception. Um, there was very matter-of-fact note-taking, which was a good thing, frankly. Um, my impl implementation of pop, you know, obviously you've got a ring, you're going to push things on, you're going to pop things off. My implementation of pop was unpopular. Um, it was described as not really worth putting in the standard. <laughs> Yeah, maybe if it was you know, a circular range, or, or, or didn't own the memory, or if it supported iteration, um, or, and, and, and could you present it with a specification rather than a, a header synopsis? Um, and it was a longer list of feedback than I was expecting, certainly. Um, but I was contacted by someone who'd come up with an alternate implementation um, after my presentation at CPPCon, Arthur O'Dwyer. His version was based on a buffer constructor, you know, a pointer and an amount of data. Um, and it solved many of the concerns of the committee. So we combined our efforts, spruced it up, published the paper, polished the paper again, where it went to Jacksonville uh, in Florida. Uh, Michael Wong represented us again, and we got more feedback. Everyone was much happier with it, very positive review. And then it went to the GDC. So GDC is the Game Developer Conference. Happens in San Francisco every year. Lovely place again. Um, Arthur presented it there. Again, it got some good feedback. And I'm hoping to finish before Ulu. Um, a lot longer than I was expecting to spend on getting this paper out. But everyone is looking at it very, very, very carefully. It's really important. There are so many C++ users. They're relying on a careful, considered, measured evolution of the language. Um, do submit a paper. If none of you have submitted papers, you know, if you've got a good idea, submit a paper. Find a reflector. Uh, find one of the study groups that's relevant to what you're doing. And, and you know, say, hey, how about this? You know, everything's going to be considered. Um, these guys, they spend a remarkable amount of their own time um, trying to improve the language. No one's paid for any of this. It's all voluntary. Uh, they're doing it because they care. They really, really care. It's, it is quite illuminating seeing the amount of effort going towards you know, just discussing my paper. And there is, you know, sometimes there's over 100 papers being discussed at their, at their one-week meetings. There's, there's two, three, or four of them a year. Right, flat map and sets. So these are associative containers, um, which probably come a close third behind vector and array for uh, quantity of usage. Typically, sadly, they're usually implemented in terms of red-black tree, which is about as cache unfriendly as we can get. Um, unordered map and unordered set use hashing, uh, but hashing is tricky to get right and to avoid collisions. Um, Sean Middleditch is leading the charge on flat map, flat set, flat multi-map, and flat multi-set. And you can see the state of the proposal at this address. Game studios all have a cache-friendly map. Uh, you know, it's, it's one of the first topics that came up for consideration on the SG14 reflector. Um, it differs from the existing maps and sets by uh, requiring cache friendliness. And this presents us with some really quite hefty design issues. Um, interface similarity is it's handy for comparing unordered map with map. Um, and it allows you to you know, defer your choice uh, of which one to use until you're a long way down development and you've got benchmarks available and you can, you know, you can do proper testing. Um, but with a flat map, for example, what should element access return? Uh, because the ordinary maps, they return a pair of values. But it would be handy if we could return a pair of references. If we could turn references rather than values, then we could separate the storage of keys and values. This would make iteration simpler. Um, or we could return just the keys or just the values rather than both. 
and should be, you know, should it be sorted all level ordered storage of elements. Um, level ordered seems to yield better performance for search operations, so that means that um, insert and find are going to be uh, are, are going to be sped up. Um, but iteration must be ordered to preserve the flatness, hence storing them separate, uh, uh, storing keys and values apart. Um, this proposal is design complete; it's at the wording stage. Um, the containers. Uh, mandate contiguous allocation with growing capacity, so you know, similar to a vector. Uh, there's a, the iteration of elements must be ordered, um, and the underlying algorithm is implementation defined. Uh, the interface will be compatible with existing ordered associative containers where it makes sense to do so, uh, but will break compatibility where necessary. So it's not going to be as easy to drop in and, you know, unordered map or just map. Back to memory. How do we deal with a range of memory? Do you want to talk about spelling? I've spelled uninitialized with an S because I'm British. I'm English. Um, the ISO C++ standard uh, spells uninitialized with a Z. I'm going to use that in the symbols. But when I'm speaking, you should imagine me spelling it with an S. Brent Friedman's leading this effort, so you can view the paper here. So the motivation arises from writing containers that don't rely on standard allocators. Um, where it's necessary to manage, manage memory directly. And this paper fills in the gaps. So start with a quick reminder of the state of play. So we have six functions and a class. Uninitialized copy, an uninitialized copy n, which copies a range of objects to an uninitialized area of memory. We have uninitialized fill and uninitialized fill n, which copies a single object to an uninitialized area of memory, or a number of filled objects to the area of memory. And we have git temporary buffer, which, oh, and return temporary buffer, of course. Um, so get temporary buffer will allocate uninitialized storage, and return temporary, bu temporary buffer will free uh, uninitialized contiguous storage. Finally, we have this beauty, raw storage iterator, which is a class which allows algorithms to output their results into uninitialized memory. Does anyone here use these entities? Mm. No, these are a mystery to me. I'd never actually heard of them before, uh, you know, prior to discussion on SG14. Uh, and I started reading cppreference.com. I thought, right, I'm going to read the lot. cppreference.com, top to bottom. And uh, yeah, that was an undertaking, but you know, really quite illuminating. Um, and I found out I've already implemented these myself. I've done all of these um, with equivalent results, but with different names. Great minds think alike. Awful, seldom differ. You choose. Um, this whole discussion about uninitialized memory um, took place over about five weeks um, last summer. It was a joy to observe, a very gentlemanly, careful discussion on, on, on a public forum, which seems to be dire. Have you, have you looked at public forums recently? Just idiots, idiots talking to each other, talking rubbish. This is fantastic. It really is worth looking on reflectors. So this paper adds four new symbols for construction and destruction. So destroy calls the destructor for specified elements. And this first appeared in the STI template library, which is the father of the, grandfather actually, of the, uh, of the C++ standard template library. Um, somehow it got lost in migration, but it does turn up. Uninitialized move performs move construction of elements over a range of memory, similar to uninitialized copy. And we have an N version as well. Uninitialized value construct performs value construction of objects over a range of memory. And uninitialized default construct performs default constructions of objects over a range of memory. So the proposal uh, is another situation where existing practice <coughs> is being brought to the surface. Um, there's already equivalence for all of these functions in several libraries. Um, you know, we can see all through here. Um, EASTL's use of Un un uninitialized fills to implement uninitialized value construct is suboptimal, actually, it turns out, and requires constructing an additional object and moving it and destroying it. So we might, might make a change to that. Um, there are three significant design considerations. First of all, exception handling. We obviously have to take account of exception handling. Um, so as always, with moving, we have to worry about the effect of exceptions. Moving to uninitialized memory is a move construction. Um, so throwing may leave the move from objects in a poorly defined state. However, um, the std move algorithm run the std move r value cast. If you look at the std move algorithm, 
Um, it has no special support for this case. So storing constructors for this uh, can be treated you know, in a similar way. We already have license uh, from prior art. Um, we could add uninitialized move if no accept, um, which would forward to uninitialized copy or uninitialized move as appropriate. Lipstead C++ actually uh, implements a, ver uh, a variation of uninitialized move by combining a move iterator with uninitialized copy. Um, so you could actually drop uninitialized move and uninitialized move n if there was you know, sufficient motivation. Um, but the symmetry of retaining these symbols does make it easier to teach, I find. So I would be, I would be sad to see it go. And finally, we need to ask, now this is a really weird question, actually. Do bidirectional or should bidirectional iterators destroy objects in reverse order? And if you're going to initialize in one direction, then we expect it to destroy in the, in the, in the opposite direction. But the author argues no, um, because it would be a very strange API which requires users to provide reverse iterators to destroy effectively in forward order. And reverse order destruction can be provided by explicitly providing a reverse iterator. Explicitness is the key here. We're, we're giving flexibility to the user. Um, and the semantics of an algorithm, it shouldn't change based on the iterator category. You know, this could lead to surprises during code maintenance, to say the least. So leaving the order as um, implementation defined will, will, you know, will likely damage its use. So we now have a full set of algorithms that, that operate on uninitialized memory which now means that developers can write specialized array-based containers, which is very lovely. So particularly, value initialization becomes a mem set to zero. Uh, default initialization and destruction are no ops now. And move construction becomes a mem copy, or a mem move. Consider an array of unique pointer. So this can be cheaply moved if you mem copy to the destination and then mem set the source to zero. Um, so if we just add some custom type traits, for example, is zero initialized, or destructive move is mem copy and mem set, or uh, destruction of zero initialized entities is a no-op. Type traits have long names for good reason. But then you can use Sphenai tricks um, and use these new uninitialized storage entities uh, to improve your custom library, which leads us to the idea of relocatable types. This is lovely. Anything that is no-throw movable and no-throw destructible can be copied if we promise that we'll destroy, um, destroy the source straight away. Uh, and this is relocation. This is, this is your Star Trek transporter conundrum, where you just you know, you take a selection of your top-ranking officers and a couple of guys in red shirts. You, you destroy them, and then you rebuild them somewhere else on a planet elsewhere. Um, has anyone used Realloc recently? Oh, <laughs> it's a disgusting function, isn't it? <laughs> um, but Resizing vectors suddenly becomes trivial because one call to realloc all at once will perform allocation of new storage, it will copy or move the items to that new storage, and it will destroy the old items. Okay, so you know, I'd happily take that saving. Right, um, anyone here remember what was significant about the Intel 486DX processor? Sorry? It didn't work. <laughs> Is that, that, that's not the answer I'm looking for. Yes? No Pardon? No coprocessor. No co indeed. Floating point processing. Excellent. It was indeed the first Intel processor to ship with a floating point unit as standard. Before then, you'd have to buy an additional floating point coprocessor. So this brings us on to fixed point numbers. The trouble is, unless you have a background in mathematics, perhaps, or, or experience with pre 4860X CPUs, then you possibly take non-integer arithmetic for granted, um, which is not necessarily a bad thing. That's kind of the point of standards, is to take all this stuff away from you so you don't need to worry about it. Who's heard of IEEE 754? Ah, I love this show. <laughs> Great. Um, so this is the standard for non-integer um, arithmetic. It celebrated its 30th birthday last year. Um, it's fabulous, a fabulous standard. Um, it uses two formats offered by, uh, sorry, so our standard, the C++ standard, uses two formats, which are offered by IEEE 754, and it adds a third, which is not part of the IEEE standard. So we have the float and double, which corresponds to binary 32 and binary 64 in the IEEE standard. And we also have long double, of course, which is typically an 80-bit value. Um, 
the IEEE standard, it, it's a great mature piece of work. It's been optimized to hell and back on silicon for, for, for many years now. It delivers comparable speed to integer arithmetic, which I find unbelievable. Sometimes it's faster. Um, occasionally it's slower. Division, that is is problematic. But there are two problems with floating point. The first is that not all processors offer native floating point registers. And the second is that we have an uneven point distribution. Uh, let me describe this a bit more carefully. It's, it's, it, this is a significant problem for simulation. Consider the representation of a float here. As operations are carried out, um, numbers will grow or reduce in size. They'll, they'll change. Um, now, the exponent will get larger or smaller. And this effectively means that the, um, what we have, it's, we have a dynamic radix point. This is the name floating point. So the radix point is the bit that separates the integer from the fractional part. Um, and this means that we can represent a vast, vast chunk of the rational number line, but it comes at the cost of precision. We, in fact, have five decimal orders of magnitude with a floating point number, with 32-bit floating point numbers. This means that 10 kilometers can only be resolved to about one meter, one part in 10,000. Um, this is a problem. Um, everything has a position coordinate in our games. Uh, joints and skeletons, ends of fingers, ends of blades, that kind of thing. Now, if we can only resolve one meter from 10 kilometers, then we might not have enough precision. And so we might have to move to double precision, which means doubling the size of our data. That is not an appealing thought. Um, in a large battlefield, we have fists landing on faces. You know, we have blades missing people by centimeters. Um, you might decide that you want to restrict combat from the center of the battlefield. <laughs> this was seriously considered. <laughs> but this, this, this is the floating point. This is a 2D representation of the floating point um, distribution. So you've got a big concentration at the center because your precision is much higher at the center. And it tails off towards the end. Um, so you might say, all right, the designers might say to you, then don't fight at the edges. <laughs> only... only <laughs> Only fight in the center. Don't, don't fight. Just, uh, the edges are for running away anyway. We don't have, a, we don't, we don't, we don't have any fighting there. <laughs> um, no, no. The, 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 you know, the, the designers gave us this strange look. And, and they, no, they, they, no. No. <laughs> not doing that. So, fixed point numbers. Now, one solution is to decide that rather than have an uneven distribution of numbers um, over a huge range, have a fixed resolution fixed distribution of numbers over a smaller range. This is what you're doing. You're sacrificing range for precision. And this is the motivation behind fixed point arithmetic. So John McFarlane, formerly of Creative Assembly, um, my employers, and Lawrence Crowell um, have two papers in flight. So the first paper offers a set of tools for defining and manipulating fixed point types. Um, SG6 is also considering this work. It's a more appropriate group devoted to numerics, if you remember the chart from the beginning. Um, SG14 is actually user-focused rather than feature-focused. Um, and this means there's potential for a lot of crossover with the other study groups. Um, we're actually cooperating with SG1 as well, the concurrency group. Um, I'll cover that when I talk about parallelism. Um, so this is a library extension, and it consists of some class and function templates, two of which are appended to the type traits header. And then the remainder live in a new header file called fixed points. So let's take a look. Fixed point numbers are specializations of this beauty, class fixed point. Um, so the first parameter is the capacity and signedness of the underlying type that represents the value. Uh, by default, this is int. And then the second parameter is equivalent to the exponent, which shifts the stored value by the requisite number of bits necessary um, to produce the desired range. The default is zero which makes, effectively makes an integer. So now we have two helper types, make fixed and make u fixed. So they offer a more intuitive description because they give you um, a cardinal number of integer and fractional digits, which is you know, easier to apprehend. And there's a signed and an unsigned version. I imagine this would probably be the, this is how you distinguish your types uh, in actual code. Here's pi. 
so pi, make fix 229. This is 32. Can you read this? This is, this is large enough. Okay, good, yeah. I was a bit worried about that. Um, it's a 32-bit signed fixed point number. Okay, so it's got two integer digits, 29 fractional digits, and then one digit for the sign. Um, fixed numbers, uh, fixed point numbers can be explicitly converted to and from arithmetic types. Um, uh, in that, uh, significant digits um, are not lost, but rounding errors are made. So all the, all the high big value stuff is preserved, all the low value stuff is lost. Um, so this, for example, equates to true, um, and it's considered an acceptable rounding error. So what's going on here is we have 0 0.006, and that can't be represented with four fractional digit, with um, four binary places. So it's the same as zero. Um, operator overloads are provided, performing as little runtime computation as practically possible. Uh, with the exception of shift and comparison of operations, um, binary operators can take any combination of one or two um, uh, fixed point arguments and zero or one arguments of any arithmetic types, that being int or float. Um, when non-identical, we have promotion-like rules, which are applied to determine the return type. So when both arguments are fixed points, the result type is the size of the larger type. It's signed if either input is signed, and it has the maximum integer bits, that's the bit on the left, of the two inputs. If one argument is a floating point type, and the other is a, is, is a fixed point, then the resulting type is the smallest floating point type of equal or greater size than the input, And if one argument is an integral type, then the result type is the other fixed point type. Right. Let's look at some examples. So make unsigned fixed 8 using 5 and 3, plus make un unsigned fixed 3 using 4 integer and 4 fractional. That will promote about 5 to there, because that's the larger type, and we get 11. For 8 plus an integral type, integer type, we have the same result. From mu fixed to float, we get float. Right, overflow and underflow need to be taken into consideration. So look at this. 15 plus 1. Thank you. Unfortunately, 4 bits. Ooh, what do we do? We have an overflow. Uh, now, the result depends on how the representation type handles overflow. So for built-in signed types, the result's undefined. For built-in unsigned types, it will wrap. And that's overflow. That's all it is. We're used to it from normal integer maps. Underflow requires a little more getting your head around. Um, so look at this. 15 divided by 2. is seven and a half. Mm. Maths degree, right? <laughs> <laughs> now, seven can be represented with six bits. Half can be represented with one bit. Are we all comfortable why a half can be represented with one bit? You're dividing two, 16, eight, four, two, one, half. Ooh, half, there we are. So we have an accurate result. What about this? The answer is seven because we don't have any fractional bits to use. Okay? We suffer a loss of precision. Generally considered acceptable, though, because we're looking at the, most, the, the biggest chunk of the data. When all bits are lost due to underflow, then the value is said to be flushed. And like overflow, the result of a flush depends on the representation type. In the case of builds and integral types, the value becomes zero. Now, dealing with errors, resulting from overflow and flush, are the biggest headaches in the domain, to be honest. Integers are easier to deal with. They have no fractional bits. Um, floating point values are shielded from the problem because they've got this variable exponent. So it just grows and shrinks to accommodate the, the, the changes in magnitude. So the paper presents four strategies. Number one, leave it to the user. You're using it. Your problem, matey. Caveat emptor. Um, allow the user to provide a custom type for the representation type. So you could actually have, you could create a whole new type for representing 
uh, fixed point numbers uh, and, and just handle it all in there. Um, promote the results to a larger type. Effectively, what float, what float does, what double does, is they'll just increase the size of the exponent or adjust the exponent of the result upwards. Now, for arithmetic operators, choice one most closely follows the built-in behavior. It's default, it's, it's undefined for signed, and it wraps for unsigned. It causes the least surprise, requires less computation. But the third and fourth options represent different trade-offs that you can do, neither of which is the best fit in all situations. You're going to have to decide which one you want to use. Particularly, this construct may fail. So C equals A plus B, A plus C equals B. And if A, B, and C were all ints, A would equal B. Uh, A would equal C. But if they're fixed points, that actually might fail. So we have function templates to deal with this. We have promote, which will return the same value represented by a larger fixed point specialization. So, for example, this expression, make fixed 15 to 5 to 15 and a half, is the same as make fixed 11 4 15 and a half. See here, we've got eight bits being used, one sign bit, five integer bits, two fraction bits. And here we have a 16 bit value, one sign bit, 11 integer bits, four fractional bits. And there's a complementary function, demote, which reverses the process. And finally, we have some named arithmetic functions, some unary functions. Uh, prefix with trunk and promote for reciprocal square and square root, and some binary functions. Oh. There they are. And some binary functions add, subtract, multiply, divide. You can see what they are. You'd expect these, they're there. The paper does go into further detail about the representation type and things you can do with it. It's quite a long paper, but it's really good. It's worth a read. Um, work is not quite finished. There was some feedback from GDC 2016. Um, Looks like it's going to enter the language, though. It's a really good idea. Can you ask? When? Well, um, I think C17 is the target. I think that's going to be voted on. Uh, actually, I think it might be being voted on in here next year. Uh, I think there's an ISO meeting in Bristol. I could be. Hello? Let's see. You know, with this is this. I'm not going to teach you how to use this. We don't know yet. We have to suck it and see. People, are, there are people who are using this. There's not much report on it. There's not much literature. Give it a go. It's this isn't something that requires compiler support. You can take a look at this and see if it suits you. If it doesn't suit you, if there are things that are completely wrong with it, tell us. Stop us from making that horrible mistake of introducing a ghastly feature into the language. Because that's what's going to happen if, if, if nobody complains. Um, but will games actually adopt all this? You know, there's, 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 that, that, that thing's a thing for, for world representation. The thing is, pathfinding failures. If you haven't played a game and you've seen a character just like bang against a door, just, just forever, because he's stuck, he can't move, quite often that's really down to um, approximation artifacts, because he's in a giant world and he can't really resolve the width of a door. Um, so this is obviously bad news, having agents stuck trying to navigate geometry. And the code to deal with approximation, it's messy. It's computationally burdensome, very burdensome, actually. Um, also, the renderers that we use, OpenGL, Vulkan, DirectX, they work in floats. They don't work in fixed point numbers. Um, with renderers, precision isn't necessary. You've got, you know, 1080 by 1920 pixels to deal with. That's a very small range of, you know, the floats are great for that. You're not going to see any kind of approximation artifacts at that resolution. Um, so range is very convenient in vector math, where you're multiplying vectors many times over, and they're getting very large. So if we are going to use fixed point, we've, got the th we've also got the thorny issue of um, when to convert from world to render types. What's the conversion cost? How do you establish the cost for existing engines? I think it's probably going to be a good thing to do, but it will take some optimization. Alternatively, Bypass System International entirely. We don't need no, we don't need no stinking SI units. Why not work in millimeters? Th yeah, 32 bits in millimeters will take you from Greenland to Yemen. Pardon? There is. I'm covering that next. See foreshadowing. <laughs> it's brilliant, isn't it? 
Right. In fact, vector is second only to static for the number of meanings. Um, we have the container. We have the, <laughs> we have the container. We have the mathematical construct. You know, there's a vector with direction and magnitude. That's all. Um, and we have operations on a vector of data with a simple instruction. This is SIMD. Single instruction, multiple data. So this is data level parallelism. This isn't concurrency because we have simultaneous computations in a single process. Okay? Common image processing. This, this is a typical example of SIMD. If you want to change an attribute of an image, you've got a big, big old slab of pixels and they're all too bright and you want to make them a bit darker, then you have to do the same computation on each pixel. And if you can do that computation on batches of eight pixels, it's going to be faster. 256 bits, uh, 256 bit registers is still a bit of a luxury though. Um, MMX was the first place where I came across this in 1997. So with there, you had um, MMX with a slab of eight 64 bit registers, and they could be eight 8 bit registers, um, four 16 bit registers or two 32-bit registers. So an individual register could be treated in a number of ways. There's a group of eight, or a group of four, or a group of two. Um, unfortunately for me, those shared registers, or those registers were shared with the floating point stack. So it's pretty useless for 3D maths because I was going to be using those anyway for, 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 for my other computations. Um, and actually, it was at this point that I thought, you know what, fixed point actually is a contender here. So I could use fixed point, I could use MMX, things would go like a train. AMD, however, set the cat among the pigeons with their 3D Now. Now, their 3D Now SIMD, uh, SIMD library actually supported the binary 32 uh, IEEE format, which meant that suddenly we had floats available for SIMD. So suddenly you had a processor that was absolutely cracking for 3D games. Um, you could operate on two floats simultaneously. Um, as time went on, though, 3D cards st started taking on a lot of the load for this. There's more of this later. In 99, Intel was ready to, uh, to, to debut the streaming SIMD extensions. And so this, this is a whole new set of eight 128-bit floating, uh, floating point registers, bundled as four binary 32 numbers. Um, so 3D math deals with, uh, deals with vectors with four elements, um, X, Y, Z, and W. Um, so now you could store a whole vector in a single register. Um, and, and it was independent of the floating point stack. You know, sanity was restored. Um, with SSE 2, 2001, integer support was added, and this largely made MMX redundant. Um, there was more variety of representation. You could have binary 64, you could have 16-bit integers. Um, SSE 3 added instructions which actually improved 3D maths, um, and SSE 4 added a dot product, would you believe it, to its new instructions. That was a win. Um, AVX featured a new instruction set, a new coding scheme, uh, and a doubling of the register width to 256 bits. That's 2011, oh, this is five years ago, and we're starting to be able to rely on AVX in our consumer machine. AVX2 expanded most of the instructions to 256 bits, um, as well as adding three operand supports, like A times B plus C, three operands in there, single instruction. AVX512 is just around the corner. One wonders where it will end, frankly, but what 512 gives you um, is the opportunity to store a four by four matrix of float 32 values in a single register. Once you've got a matrix in a single register doing SIMD, you're, uh, you, you, it goes faster, basically, that's what I'm saying. It goes faster. <laughs> Fastest goes. <laughs> Further accelerating 3D math is what I've written down here, but I'm so excited about it, I just can't read my notes. Um, but this is just the Intel set. Um, there are other SIMD instruction sets found on other CPUs, which leads us to actually the biggest problem. There's no standard to abstract all of these things from. Um, unlike IEEE 754, manufacturers can do what they like. Oh, this will be good for our silicon. We'll stuff this in, you know. Um, the Boost library already has a candidate, um, which looks at implementing uh, the transcendental functions using SIMD types. Um, Matthias Gonard, I don't know how he says his surname. I've never met the man. Um, He's from Bloomberg. He's one of the authors. And he drafted a paper this January. And it suggests how uh, explicit usage of short, explicit usage of short vectors within the, within the type system might make use of SIMD architectures. 
Um, SG1 is looking at this, the concurrency priors and people. Um, there are quite a lot of papers actually related to SIMD proposals. Um, but let's take a swift tour through Matthias's paper. Running short on time here. Um, right. Um, the first problem in accommodating all of the SIMD libraries is that trying to establish this common base set of functionality. Um, some architecture, uh, actually, some architecture, even within SSE, will provide some instructions for some types, but not for other types. So there might be some instructions that are only available to Institute, but they haven't been implemented for, for um, binary 32 or binary 64. Some of them don't have double precision available to them. So the paper suggests the SIMD vector should look like this. Um, SIMD vector. Uh, where n's a power of two, obviously. Um, and if vectors of arbitrary powers of two sizes can be defined, then functions which combine or slice these vectors into larger or smaller ones would be useful. So we get a combined function and a slice function. Um, I'm going to be making this presentation public, by the way. Uh, so I'm, I'm just going to speed on through here. Take my word for it, OK, it's fine. <laughs> so we would need a generic um, casting operation to convert between integer and floating point. Hang on, what's going on here? Casting. We still we still need to cast between various si yeah, b b between various sizes. And to if we've got integer SIMD and float SIMD uh, types, we, we want to be able to swap between the two. Um, some SIMD architectures actually have entire units uh, dedicated to permuting all of their values quickly. So let's have a shuffle function. So we can shuffle all our things around. Um, aliasing. This is actually probably the thing that we we need to consider most of all. Um, Intel intrinsics allow aliasing between vectors and scalars. Um, so vectors aliasing scalars would, would look like this. We've got a pile of aligned data coming in, and we want to make a SIMD vector out of those eight, out of that, out of that memory. We've got a chunk of memory saying, right, put these eight floats, for example, into a vector. Um, so we can re reinterpret, well, use reinterpret cast on your aligned data, do your stuff which allows you to pass a vector of raw memory with maximum efficiency rather than copying the memory onto the stack. Um, other way around, it looks like this. So you have a vector of float, a SIMD vector of float, and then you take a reference to the first one, and then you start changing the third one. The, tr the trouble with all of this, um, it looks nice, but it forces the vector into memory, which rather defeats the object of the exercise. Um, optimally, everything should stay in registers, and only load and store should actually go to memory. And uh, calling conventions have an impact as well. SIMD vector is defined as a class, and some ABIs don't allow passing such a type because of um, alignment issues, and they'll pass by const reference instead. Again, defeating the entire object of the exercise. Um, so this might require something like a false inline, a false inline attribute that would keep things in registers or better still, compiler support for SIMD so that the uh, types can be passed you know, with optimal efficiency. Um, right, quickly, heterogeneous computing. Um, right, two seminal blog posts from Herb Sutter. The free lunch is over, which was December 2004. Feels like yesterday, 12 years ago, 11 years ago. And Welcome to the Jungle, which was in December 2011. Um, so the first one, the free lunch is over, talked about the impending expiry of Moore's Law. And Welcome to the Jungle said, OK, now we've got multiple cores. We need to start using multiple different CPUs on motherboards and adding cards and on the cloud. And this is massive parallelism, really, which requires a new programming model, SG1. They're flying this one nicely. We have a head start in games. Let me take you back to the 90s. 1996, to be precise. This is an extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary year for video games. Everything changed. So this year, 1996, saw the release of Duke Nukem 3D, Resident Evil, Quake, Super Mario 64, Wipeout, and Diablo, along with Civilization 2, Panzer Dragoon 2, Warcraft 2, Tekken 2, The Elder Scrolls 2, and Command and Conquer, Red Alert, the sequel. Um, also this year, though, Tomb Raider was released for the Sega Saturn, uh, and then for MS-DOS and for PlayStation. 1996 also saw the Voodoo graphics chip from 3DFX and the sudden appearance of graphics cards. Um, there was the Orchid Righteous, the Diamond Monster, the Cannabis Pure. Um, the Orchid Righteous had mechanical relays, and every time you said, right, we're going into 3D, it would suddenly click at you as everything switched on. Um, a friend of mine popped round with the Diamond Monster, 
Um, he put it into my machine, downloaded a patch for Tomb Raider, and suddenly the frame rate shot up. I suddenly had this really fast, smooth operating Tomb Raider. It was lovely. And there was a huge uptake for 3DFX cards. And suddenly, games dev went multiprocessor. And so for about 20 years now, we've divided our games between um, rendering and simulation. Guess what else happened in 1996? DirectX 2 shipped in June with Direct 3D. Now, the Voodoo Graphics chipset supported two APIs. It supported OpenGL, because it's a graphics card, but it also supported an API called Glide. They didn't write DirectX drivers. Um, and Glide didn't last a distance, and 3DFX went bankrupt in 2002. Uh, they were bought up by NVIDIA. Some engineers from 3DFX went to work on the GeForce chipset, particularly the FX series. Some joined ATI, which is now owned by A uh, AMD, and they worked on the Radeon chipset. And there we have it. They're, they're all our chipsets. Um, and I make this point about these two manufacturers because plenty of domestic machines out there um, have extra processors. They're, 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 they're idling when the user isn't playing a game. Consider using them. Be wary of fan noise. Um, so how can we export what we've learnt into the standard? Well, we've got Michael Wong, Mr. Parallelism, convening SG14. Um, we've had several talks over the past few years on accelerator design. Uh, sorry, past few months on accelerator design. We had um, uh, from NVIDIA. Uh, they have a library called Agency. Um, it's open source. Check out the repository. Um, it has things like uh, control structures for execution. So we've got bulk invoke, bulk async, and bulk then. We have execution policies for parameterizing control structures and agents which parameterize user lambdas and executors which create execution agents. So here's a very common activity, F equals, so X equals AX plus, AX plus B. Um, so with bulk invoke, we're saying, let's do this many times over. Uh, we have bulk async, which returns a stood future. Um, the stuff in red is the thing that's, stuff that's been imported from the agency namespace. That's bulk async. And then we have bulk then. So this has a dependency, which is that up there, which is the stud future, stud future goes on, which is passed in there. And so then will depend on that future. Uh, we also had uh, Ben Sanders speaking to us about the heterogeneous C++ compiler, which produces code for the CPU and for the GPU. Um, Harmut Kaiser, he spoke about the parallelism APIs in HPX. Um, Andrew Richards spoke about Cycle. Um, all of these papers, they're, they're on the reflector. Take a look at the reflector. Um, it really is the next big frontier for all of us. Have a comment. Tell us what's wrong. Tell us what needs to be, needs to be improved. Finally, um, join the subgroup. We could really do with everyone's, everyone's input. In fact, join any subgroup. Take a look at the reflectors and say, yeah, you're doing it wrong. You need to do it like this. That's what we need to hear. If you're using this stuff, we need to hear from you. Um, and improve the standard. Is the standard perfect? No. Let's make it better. Thank you very much.